Hey everyone, welcome to my series on Automation 360 Programming and today we are going to discuss Bot Framework in Automation 360. I have received uh, email requests in the past to you know, upload a video on Bot Framework. So today I thought before we go into building the Bot Framework from scratch, let's discuss the significance of the Bot Framework and the logic that goes behind building a Bot Framework. So let's start. So before we start creating a bot framework we need to understand what is the use of a bot framework what is the significance of a bot framework now a bot framework is basically created to standardize the overall architecture of a bot across all processes in that particular control room regardless of the size or the complexity of the process the framework remains same now what we have here is a, a very simple bot framework illustrated over a, a pictorial view on Excel. We have the bot structure and we have the folder structure. These two are the very vital components of a bot, bot framework. Now what does the bot structure contain? It contains the control room folder structure. <coughs> so let's say in case <coughs> a process has uh, a process belongs to a certain department, let's say uh, finance. And under finance, it could be accounts payable. And under accounts payable, this process could be, let's say, process 1. So the control room folder structure that is created needs to clearly uh, define or clearly represent the hierarchy or the department to which that process belongs to. So this is the first thing that we need to uh, take into account. And then we can look at the master task. The naming convention of the master task could be something like uh, main task underscore process name or it could be empty underscore process name. There are few who would also prefer to have a process code attached to the process name. So let's say we have a process code and then the process name. Under the master task, we will have subtasks and common tasks. So these common tasks are basically reusable components that could be uh, very well used with other processes or other master tasks. In the folder structure, we have two <coughs> different locations. One is the local drive and the other is the shared drive. Now the question comes, why do we need two locations? So I have seen frameworks where they just prefer to have one shared drive location. But for some reasons, which I'm like going to explain now, I normally go with both local and shared drive. Let's say uh, you are receiving input from a certain shared drive location. Now you cannot directly open the file from that location. That file could be already opened by someone and that could create a read conflict. For those reasons, it's always better to take a copy of the file, bring it to an input location in the local directory and then start the work. That will also increase the performance overhead. In case it's a heavy duty Excel file with a lot of sheets and huge amount of data, it will take a lot of time to open and process the file directly from a shared location. So I have using direction arrows, I have also uh, tried to show here the direction in which the files move from shared to local or local to shared. So a typical framework would have a local root folder and a shared root folder under which it will be the same structure that is followed where we have the process name and under that we have the input, output, log, screenshots, config and temp folders. So like the name already suggests, input is where our input is stored, output is where the bot stores the output, a log folder will contain any kind of Excel or CSV logs, screenshots will contain uh, screenshots in case there is any error, config will contain the user config file or the business mapping file, and temp folder is for any uh, calculation that is done during the processing of the bot. Now when the bot actually starts to run, the first thing that happens is we bring the config file and we bring the input file from the shared drive to the local drive and when the bot is done with its processing it has it has already stored the output the log and screenshots in the local drive which it needs to now transfer to the shared drive now all these folders input output log screenshots these four folders they will definitely need to have subfolders with timestamp in them for example we can have a timestamp like yyyy mm dd hh mm ss 
So a timestamp which signifies the date and time all the way to seconds can be used to differentiate between multiple runs of that bot within the same day or maybe in a daily basis. So which makes it even more important that when we copy the input uh, data from share to local, we copy only that day's, the current day's file and not the previous day's file. Now all these things will be part of the bot framework coding. So the bot framework, the entire bot framework as a whole acts as a wrapper around your core business logic. Now let's try and understand what all activities a master task would perform during the bot run. So when a master task runs, the first thing it needs to do is to create a an execution ID. So it basically creates a unique ID which can be a combination of the username along with the timestamp which is unique for that particular execution. That will differentiate this execution or the files created with this execution from any other file. The next thing it needs to do is to send out email notification. It sends out an email notification to the business users or the point of contacts for that particular process that this process has started running. It also logs an entry to the log file. Once it does all these things, then it starts the subtask section where it starts calling the subtasks one by one. Let's say we have called subtask 1, then we have called subtask 2 and so on and so forth. And once it is done with all these calls, at the end it again logs an entry to the log file saying the process is completed, sends out an email notification and then moves required data from local to shared. So this is the part where all data collected including the log files or screenshots in case of any error is moved from the local drive to the respective folders in the shared drive. Now a very interesting question over here is how does the master task know to whom to send the email notification? How does the master task know where is the log file located? What is the path? These details will be stored in the config file. The config file is a excel based file which will contain multiple sheets, each sheet for its own purpose and there would be one sheet that is common to the entire process that will contain the folder paths of all these folders. It will contain the local input folder path, it will contain the local output folder path, local log folder path. Similarly, it will contain the shared input, output log and remaining folder paths. So it's important that the master task accesses the config file first, reads the config file and gets all these path values before sending out email. Oh, sorry, I also forgot to mention it. The config file also contains the business uh, SME email IDs to whom the business or the bot related email should go to. So before doing all this uh, actions, the master task needs to read the config file. So once we create the execution ID, we need to call a set environment variable subtask. We can give it any name, but uh, just for the sake of understanding, this task is basically a uh, component which sets all the environment variables. Uh, when I say environment variables, I mean the variables which are required for our environment or our framework to work. It will con contain variables like local folder. Uh, it will contain variables like uh, local uh, input folder, local output folder, local log folder. And those variables will contain the path of these values in the local drive and in the shared drive. So once the set environment variable is called, now the bot has all the necessary variables either in different variables, string variables or in a collection in a dictionary. So either we can create different string variables as input output or we can have one dictionary. Either way, now our bot has all the necessary input output paths where the bot needs to process. Either way, now the bot has all the required 
paths from local drive and the shared drive which will help the bot in transferring files to and fro. Now one thing that's still missing from this master task is the exception handler. So we need to wrap all these actions inside a try block and at the end we should have a catch block to take care of any errors that may happen in this master task. So let me just create an indentation over here. Now the catch block will execute only if there is a critical error in the master task and for some reason the master task has failed to even execute the framework level tasks. So in that case the catch block should send out critical email notifications. Now one thing that we need to understand here is the master task should ideally never reach the catch block. For example if a subtask throws an error, the subtask would have its own try-catch block to handle that error. So a subtask would actually never return the error back to the master task. So even if a subtask fails, it will log the error to the log file, but it will gracefully come back to the master task and the master task will proceed back to the remaining steps and it will end in a normal way. But if the master task reaches catch, it means that the error happened at a framework level. Maybe the config file was missing or maybe someone renamed the config file or the config file got corrupted for some reason or maybe there is a read conflict on the config file because someone kept it open. Things like that. So when a master task reaches the catch, there is nothing much to do here because we don't have the environment variables ready with us. In that case, we need to send out critical email notifications and the email IDs should ideally be stored in, let's say, global variables in the control room. Now, one more very interesting question over here is, how does the master task, or to be more specific, how does the set environment variable subtask know where the config file is stored in the shared location? So if you remember, we have shared location and we have the local drive, right? So at the beginning of the process, the config file is copied from the shared drive and it's brought to the local drive. But how does the master task or the set environment variable subtask know where the config file is located? Do we hard code the path? No, we definitely don't do that. We create a bot config file, so which is basically a text file. So let me just uh, type the name over here, bot config.txt. Reduce the size a bit. So this would ideally be a text file which is stored in the control room right next to the master file, which contains very minimal information, which it, it can contain the location of config file. It can also contain the email IDs for critical email notifications. So instead of you know, storing them in global variables, we can actually store them over here. So the bot config file, bot config dot text file contains very minimal information to basically kickstart the process so that our set environment variable knows where to locate the config file in the shared drive location. And of course, it needs to have a uh, location of the local root. Why does it need to have that? Because when you copy the config file from a shared drive location, you need to paste it in the local drive. So you need the path of the local drive as well. So this is one more uh, location that the bot config.txt file should contain. Okay, let's uh, reduce the zoom a bit. Now let's look at the structure of the subtask. So just as we did in the master task, a subtask should already always have a uh, try catch wrapper under which all its actions are to be performed. Now the moment a subtask runs, it needs to log an entry to the log file. And then it has to uh, perform code logic where it uh, gathers the input variables. So whichever variables are marked as input for that particular subtask, those variables are consolidated over here and then the business logic starts. Once the business logic is over, 
it once again logs an entry to the log file suggesting that the subtask is completed. Once again this will have a catch but this catch is much different than the catch we saw in the master task. Why? Because in the master task catch we did not have the environment variables but in a subtask catch we do have all the environment variables. We know the location of the log file uh, path, we know the location of the screenshot path, we know the location or the email IDs of the business point of contacts to whom we need to send the emails. So the catch block in a subtask should take care of sending emails to business point of contacts, uh, logging the error line number and description details and storing a screenshot of the current screen. These three are the primary uh, actions that a catch block should perform. Now, once the subtask is completed, let's say the subtask results in an error. So subtask comes to catch block, it sends an email, uh, it uh, logs the error line number and description and it stores a screenshot. But since this error is handled, it's a handled error, it will go back gracefully to the master task. So the master task would ideally never know if a subtask has failed or not unless the subtask returns some kind of an information back to the master task. How to do that? This is where an error flag comes into picture. So we create an error flag and we set that flag to true in case of an error. But in the try block, that error flag will remain false. Now, going back to our master task, let me just undo this and go back to the master task. In the master task, we had a subtask sub section where we were calling the subtasks one by one. So, very possible that there could be a logic that if subtask one fails, we do not go ahead and execute subtask two. So, this is where we would use the error flag that is returned from the subtask. So right after a call happens to a subtask, we will check the error flag here. So we check if error flag equal to true, exit here. And then after that, we'll have the call to subtask 2. So basically, and so on. So basically, if one task is failing, let me just push these things a bit. Uh, and copy this if condition right here. So basically every subtask call should have a if condition right next to it checking for the error flag. Now if subtask 1 fails and the error flag is true, we cannot go to the next statement which is subtask 2. So this exit here, how do we do that? In order to do this, the best thing or the I think the simplest way to do this is, let me just bring this down, we'll just put a loop here and say loop 1 times. So it's a loop that is running just once. So it's basically creating a block which is getting executed only once. But the beauty of this is if at all this error flag is true, we break the loop. And that's how we exit. So once we come out of this loop, did I make a mistake over here? Okay, so I think let me just remove all these things okay so once we come out of this loop the next thing the master task does is logs an entry to the log file and copy the data from local to share just like earlier so that's basically a graceful exit of the entire process so even if there is an error that happens inside the master task the inside the subtask the master task handles it gracefully by checking the error flag breaking the loop coming directly to this log file and then the copy data so this is how a very simple, very basic bot framework is built in A360. There are complex frameworks available, which are basically, you know, add-ons of uh, different, different uh, reusable components or other uh, integrations inside the framework. But the basic principle still remains same. I hope this was useful and this helps you in creating yourself a very basic or very simple framework. If you still want me to create a video on uh, actual creation of bot framework via A360 code, do let me know in the comment section. Thank you so much.